The following podcast will contain spoilers and explicit language. Hello and welcome to episode three of Yeah, It's That Bad. Tonight's movie with a 32% on Rotten Tomatoes is 2009's The Uninvited. And tonight we will be asking the question, is it really that bad? My name is Joel. And I'm Martin. (laughs) And, uh... Where to begin <laughs> with this one? <laughs> Let's do a quick plot synopsis. After the death of her ill mother in a fire, the young teenager Anna tries to commit suicide and is sent to a mental institution for treatment. Ten months later, Anna still cannot remember what had happened on the night her mother died. Her psychiatric doctor, Dr. Silberling, however, discharges her, telling her she has resolved her issues. Anna finds that her mother's former nurse, Rachel Summers, is her stepmother now. Anna meets her beloved sister Alex swimming in the sea. As time moves on, Anna is haunted by ghosts, and she believes that Rachel killed her mother. Alex and Anna decide to look for evidence to prove that Rachel is the murderer, and Anna discovers the truth about the fire in the boathouse. So Martin, let's see. What did you think of The Uninvited? As far as The Uninvited goes... I didn't think it was that bad. I thought it looked good. I liked the way it was shot. There was a few weird, super close-up face shots with weird skewed angles that were a little annoying. But other than that, it was entertaining, and I had a good time watching it. Which is strange, because usually these Japanese horror, Japanese horror remakes usually leave me feeling like a bored, just un, uninterested. This movie in particular has a really big J-horror pedigree. The guys who produced it are the same people that did The Ring, right? And The Grudge or something like that. Disturbia. They they did Disturbia and The Ring. I don't think they did The Grudge. No. Yeah, Disturbia and uh, The Grudge or The Ring. Whatever. The Ring. It's like, what? There's so many of these stupid fucking movies. They all just blend into one another. (laughs) The Ring is what started it all, I guess. No. Yeah. It is their fault that we just got... J horror after J horror after J horror, ridiculous, just clones of one another. These people are the reason. It's like a, <laughs> like a septic tank burst, and all, the, <laughs> and, all, and all this shit just oozed out all over us. You know, everybody copies it. And just look at the last movie we watched, The Unborn. That movie just, like I said before, paint by numbers, just J horror garbage from beginning to end. And they're to blame, people that made this movie. <laughs> It's really uh, unfortunate because now, yeah, just normal horror movies that didn't have any J-horror, nothing to do with, with, with Japanese horror at, at all are starting to take their, uh, their, their tricks and tips from J-horror films, such as uh, whatever the ghost or monster is going to be uh, clipping its way through the scene like they're going to cut out. <laughs> they're going to they're gonna cut out frames so it looks like the monster is having an epileptic seizure as it's moving across the room. I'm just going to jitter my way it's just gonna, across yeah, the it's room gonna, to you. It's going to jitter, jitter bug on the floor all the way across <laughs> to your bed, which I don't find scary. And another problem is the uh, the lone kid that looks like he had flower poured all over his body. He's completely white. He doesn't say anything. He just stares at you. Hi. Hi. And I, I don't think that that's scary either. If that happened to me, I would probably just kick the kid in the face because it's, 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 it's a little kid. Yeah, but what if it's a Dybbuk? If that's, you're, you're right. If it was a Dybbuk, <laughs> that'd be a problem. <laughs> were there, I, I didn't see any Dybbuks in this movie. <laughs> no, this movie was Dybbuk free. I had my eye. So maybe they used their Clobbermeister. <laughs> <laughs> and my eye opened for, for, for Dybbuks during this entire movie. I didn't see any. This movie uh, also has a, a bit of a pedigree to uh, Lemony Snicket's A Series of Unfortunate Events. Uh, yeah, it was the uh, Anna, the, the lead. The main well. girl, Emily Browning, was yeah. originally in Lemony Snicket. She was the main girl, one of the Baudelaire girls. I can't remember what her name is right now. Did her lips. They looked amazing. Did, which but, old, did, but did they look that good in Lemony Snicket's A Series yes, of Unfortunate Yes, they looked Events? even better. Because her lips looked so good in this movie. <laughs> Another Lemony Snicket uh, connection is that I actually picked this up the first time I saw this movie. The The psychiatrist's name is Dr. Silberling. Yeah. The guy who directed Lemony Snicket, Brad Silberling. 
What do you think of that? You just blew my mind. Yeah. There's there's literally blood, I am coming. A walking, there's blood coming out of my nose yeah, right I am now. the walking IMDb fun fact right here. There. I, I, I knew that. I saw that going in. I was like, oh, that's great. Okay, Martin, I'm going to ask you something that is quickly becoming a recurring theme on this podcast. What did you think <laughs> of the attractiveness of the three main female leads in this movie? We're going to start with Emily Browning. I find her super hot. Yeah. I agree with you. You know she's Australian. She she's hiding a very thick Australian accent. In this really? Movie. Yeah, like in the uh, the behind the scenes stuff for Lemony Snicket. She's got the. Uh, <laughs> she's got the dingo. Ate yeah, my baby. Yeah, put another shrimp on the bobby. On the put bobby. On the bobby. You know, yeah. Kind of okay. Thing, you know, crocodile Dundee. What's What's great about her is uh, she's got it all. She's uh, <laughs> she's short. She's got really full lips. She's the fullest. The fullest of lips. I have no idea what she could be doing with them. <laughs> But I'd, 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 I'd like to imagine. So much so that they even made a plot point in the movie where, 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 where they're putting lipstick. They're literally smearing lipstick onto her lips in front of a mirror. Yeah. You know, you have beautifully shaped lips. You just don't know what to do with them. Men will go on about a woman's eyes, but that's bullshit. What they really want is a girl. All right, here's here's something else that's interesting about the female leads in this movie. Why was there so much sexual tension between her, her sister, her stepmother? They're laying in bed together. They're rubbing each other's arms. That had to have been done on purpose. I'm going to tell you right this. I don't buy for a second that those two girls are related. They're sisters. No, they don't look like sisters. Not at, at all. Not at all. Which made it hotter or less or less hot, depending on on what you what you enjoy, <laughs> whether you're into wincest or not. Ooh, ooh, wincest. Okay, Emily Browning, she looks amazing. Great lips, great stuff. But <laughs> she, <laughs> I don't know how I'm going to come off on this, but she looked a lot better in Lemony Snicket back when she was like 14. <laughs> <laughs> or whatever, because and I'll tell you why. Here's my case. <laughs> yeah, the uh, she, her the, head. The FBI party van's gonna come. Uh, yeah, it's gonna yeah, be yeah, knocking be, soon. Gonna be, they're gonna be knocking like, soon. They're gonna be taking hello? your hard drive. Hello? <laughs> <laughs> That's the end of this podcast for for good. <laughs> <laughs> no, like the size of her head was more relatively proportional to the rest of her body. Something happened to her in the intervening Where her head's four bigger, years. Right? Yeah, yeah. In the intervening five years between Lemony Snicket and this, like her head got like wider or something. We need to go see Sucker Punch because I have a feeling they made her do all this uh, training workout to be able to fight. I bet you she lost that that skull weight. <laughs> Skull it, weight. It went right to her lips. It went right <laughs> where it belongs. And I bet you she's going to look amazing in that movie. And she's a blonde in that one. So it's going to spice it up. What do you think is going to happen to the back end? Her, <laughs> her derriere? Her derriere. I'm more interested in I'm that. sure it's tone and fit after all that training that they're making her do. They didn't really uh, show it in this movie. We didn't get any, any peek of that. No, we didn't. There was insinuation. She's, by the way, she's what, 19? She, she must be at least 18 or 19 in this movie, right? If she was 14 in Lemony Snicket, five years back in 2004, here we are five years later. It's got to be, right? What? Well, I mean, I don't know. You're you're the one who has her her birthday on a calendar. I room, have so. a shrine to her <laughs> in my closet. <laughs> I count down the days to sucker punch. I can't wait. And the other girl, let's see. What was uh her what sister? Was her, was, what was her name? Her sister was attractive too. Her sister, I, I think, was a, was the second most attractive female in this movie, and then if the mother take... was the third. However, if they just cut the the movie at that scene where the mother is being introduced with the. Uh, Sweaty with their, breasts with the, the the sweaty chesticles sticking out. I would have to rate her mother as number two. That that was Elizabeth Banks. You okay. know, if they could take somehow surgically remove Emily Browning's lips and put them on the <laughs> sister's head, <laughs> we'd have a, the perfect human. But they're but but they're taking Banks' breasts yes. and putting them on. Yes, yes, yes. We need to do a triple bypass. <laughs> Wait, oh yeah. Yeah, so the, the second sister will be the the base body. Will will be the base body. You know what's you know what's interesting? Men and women do this all the time. They take body parts like they're Dr. Frankenstein and they're going <laughs> to construct a perfect human. The 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 idea of it is funny, I guess, but it's also disgusting when you think about it. You're like cutting these people up. 
Oh, look at this. Uh, the, the, the older sister's name is Ariel Kebel, and she starred in The Grudge 2. There's Man. your J-Hara connection right she there. She just can't get away. Yeah. Oh, she was in John Tucker Must Die. One of your favorites, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Great movie. You know what? That actually would be a good movie for this. John Tucker Must Die? I would love to rip that. I would rather shit. die I would lo- than I would, watch it. I would love to rip that apart. But yeah, you're right. It would be a, the perfect candidate for this show. I would love to rip that apart. For this show. All right. So since we're on the, uh, on, on, on the subject of sisters here, what did you think about the bed scene? There's a scene in the movie where the two sisters are lying in bed caressing each other. Yeah. Sensually. Like rubbing very each sensually. Other. And she's like, please. Consoling each other. Please stay with Don't me. Don't go. Please, you have to lay in bed with me until I fall asleep. <laughs> Just, just don't leave me. To which her sister re- replies, "Oh man, I can't even imagine how many times we've done this. If I had ten dollars, if I had ten dollars for every time, time we've done this, this, she'd be a multimillionaire, I guess. I don't know. I don't know what that's supposed to imply." I'm gonna go to bed. No, please stay with me till I fall asleep. Oh, if I had ten bucks for every time I heard that. Thank you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> no funny stuff. <laughs> They also go around taking batteries out of vibrators, but that's a whole nother. That was an amazing scene. They found a... there's a, a vibrator in this PG-13 <laughs> J-horror movie. They find a vibrator. Meet Mr. Chubby. Oh, that's disgusting. No, I'm not touching that. I'm surprised they didn't do like anything else with it. Like They drop it on the floor and it vibrates. That's like, a, like one of the big scares. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would have been amazing. That would have scared me. <laughs> hey, okay, so the thing, the uh, things popping out to scare you. There were nowhere there, near as many as those there was nowhere, as there were in the, un- uh, the unborn in this However, movie. in this one, it got me one time. I saw you. I saw you jumped 10 feet into the air. Fuck you. You did a, you did a backflip. <laughs> yeah, I was your attached hair, to this ceiling like a cat. <laughs> your hair was white when you came back down. <laughs> it, it got me. It was, it, it was good. Describe it. What was the scene? The scene was... Uh, a lead into her opening a uh, garbage bag. Now, a, a little uh, a, a little backstory on these garbage bags. Throughout the movie, she's opening up garbage bags, and usually there's some type of moving body in them. In this one, there wasn't. Just a can of tomato sauce falls out and rolls on the ground, resembling blood, and goes underneath a stove. Like a little, kind of like a six-inch space underneath the stove from the floor. She starts cleaning it up, and... Uh, you know, the tension had died down almost completely at that point. And then this freaking thing, I don't even know what the hell it was, comes freaking out trying to grab her. And that, <laughs> that really, it, 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 it got me good. It scraped his nails on the floor like a chalkboard, which I thought was a nice touch. Yeah. Like that noise. It looked horrible, though. The effect? Yeah, the, the effect the was effect horrendous. Was, was piss poor. It was piss poor, but it still scared me. <laughs> I mean... I think the- it, it worked in this movie because... They, they, how many of those loud noise scares were there? There were only like three or four, yeah, three at the most, probably. Whereas in the unborn, there was one every 30 seconds, so you, you're just conditioned to it for it, you know. You expect yeah, it, yeah, yeah. In this it was, movie, it was kind of unexpected, even though they, you know, you knew something was going to happen the way they built it up, but whatever. What did you think about the father? Did you think he was selfish? I, I, I was telling you about this before. The parents in this movie are very one dimensional characters the father in particular he has no depth whatsoever he exists only to sell the ending of the movie something happens in the movie that we're going to talk about in a little bit and he is the way he is just so the ending works i'll talk to that in a second is he selfish yes 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 he is i'll tell you why he is fucking uh the nurse 10 months after the wife dies. He's fucking the nurse before his wife dies. Oh, that's right. That is the, you're right. You're absolutely right. I forgot about that. He was banging the nurse while the mother was wasting was, away. Was wasting away dying of cancer or some other terminal illness. We all have needs. Yeah, I guess you can't bang a <laughs> cancer patient. Why? What the hell's wrong with you, Joel? Why can't you bang a cancer patient? You're right. They have equal rights too. You know, we treat them like normal people. We we should treat them. We should like treat them people. like anybody. I don't else. care how much cancer. There's they nothing have. wrong with them. I don't care how much cancer they have. They're they're getting laid. <laughs> yeah, Elizabeth Banks looks pretty good. So if you were in that situation, sex starved, a I'd, dying wife who you shut her away in an 
Yeah, why was she <laughs> out in the boathouse? Why was she in the... She, okay, here's, here's something really funny and doesn't make any sense. Apparently, his wife is dying, wasting away of cancer. He, this, this... This father, who is a, I guess, su- successful author because he owns an enormous house in the Pacific Northwest. Yes. Essentially is banging the nurse aide, takes his cancer-riddled wife, and puts her out in the <laughs> boathouse slash <laughs> gas line transformer room. She claims the, that. The fumes <laughs> alone, I, I, I feel, would be... A problem for for breathing, but I guess since she's dying already, it doesn't matter. Who cares? Who cares? You know, they they, they said that she wanted to be out there, uh, <laughs> but but somehow but, I doubt that. But, but they also said that she couldn't talk, so that they had a bell to ring, <laughs> like a to, dog, to like a dog. So I don't know. I don't know if her if her opinion was heard properly. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, he was he was very selfish. Almost to the point where it, it's it's distasteful to even watch, but we don't know if he actually was that selfish because, after all, we are the the movie we are seeing is being viewed through the through eyes, the eyes of, of an unreliable narrator. The narrator is the protagonist, the yeah. antagonist. Yes, Anna. Yes, and she so has be, an be, extremely skewed yeah. version of everything that be, be, happened. Be, yes. I want to ask you something. The trailers sell this movie to be a very straightforward j Har movie in which the hero girl has to confront her dad's new girlfriend and the implication being that the girlfriend has killed a string of people prior to the father, right? Correct. And that the hero girl is being haunted by the previous victims. That is what the trailer sold it to us. Now, during the course of the movie... Did you get that sense? Did you feel that the wife or the girlfriend was bad? Yeah, I did. But I, I was told that there was a twist ending. Yeah, we kind of ruined it for you. You <laughs> ruined it for me. Yeah. So There's a twist ending. Hey, there's a twist ending, keep, Martin. Keep your eyes open. There's a twist ending. Try, try and figure it out during the whole movie so you can't actually pay attention to the movie. <laughs> yeah, I wanted you to play detective. I really wanted to ruin this. Thing. Yeah, thanks, jackass. Um, So <laughs> did I get that feeling? Kind of. Not really, actually. It wasn't like a typical J horror, other than that the uh, the hero is a is a otherwise frail girl. When I first saw this movie, I went completely with what the trailer said. I did not like this movie at all the first time I saw it. I gave it a two out of five. I thought it was derivative and shitty, especially all that stuff with the um, bad girlfriend, bad mother. Oh, she's a killer! You know, she's trying to kill me. You know that that kind of stuff. What the studios wanted us to think the plot actually was i hated it i did not like that stuff at all even worse i hated the ghost story stuff the first time i saw this movie i thought that was terrible hated it but you uh you differ you liked it yeah i enjoyed it i enjoyed it thoroughly i didn't bring up before about the how j horror always has a uh, rather frail small woman as the hero but can you think of any example where it's a strong male or a, a, a male in particular where it's like a hero Okay, a Japanese horror movie where there's a strong male lead. I cannot, for the life of me, think of a single one. There was that one movie that everyone says is a good movie, and they say it's one of the scariest movies ever made called Audition. Oh. And and that had a male lead and and a female uh, villain. I fucking hated that movie. That was so boring. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, no, I can't... um, I can't think of any. Maybe, uh, maybe our listeners out there will uh, can write in. They can think of something because I sure as hell cannot. I'm trying to think also for horror movies that come out of Hollywood. Is the lead usually female? Not always. The final person is almost always a female. Final girl. They, they, that's even the a term. Final, the the final f- girl. That's a thing. Yeah, there, there, there usually is a final girl, but there's also usually a final guy. You know, they usually fall in love in the process of defeating some horror, ghost, monster, whatever you want to... F- Fill in the blank. I'll tell you. I'll tell you right and now. And you have a guy, girl. They're holding hands at the end. The sun's coming up. They survived. They're in love, and they have to cope and go on with the rest of their lives. Okay, here it is, right here. The final girl is a horror film, particularly slasher film trope that specifically refers to the last woman or girl alive to confront the killer, ostensibly the one left to tell the story. I guess it's female usually because socially everybody would equate female with being weaker and more vulnerable. 
than a than a guy. Well, yeah, so. and she's virginal and all that shit. You know, all the yeah, people yeah, that are getting killed are the ones having sex. Whatever. The but, sex thing, I think, really is more American Hollywood puritanical based. I I think that movies that come out of Europe that are horror, I don't I don't think it would be like you would have the same kind of horror movie rules where sex is like a a taboo, a, a taboo, and you're going to well, get killed if you have sex. The Europeans are a little more lenient when it comes to sex. We have movies like uh, Irreversible that have a 10 minute uncut rape scene. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we'll watch that. We are both laughing. Yeah. By the way, I think you will get a kick out of this. I just did a search for Final Girl on Wikipedia, and that came up with something. I just did a search for Final Guy. You know what that came up with? What? Final Fight Guy. (laughs) (laughs) Remember that? (laughs) Great game. (laughs) Final Fight is a great game. Speaking of of European sex scenes, the finest sex scene... Très Magnifique. Très Magnifique was by... uh, by Antichrist, I believe, was in was in the movie Antichrist. I still haven't seen it. It is shot in. There's literally like one thousand frames a second, no holds bar. They actually had sex with each other. Beautifully shot. It's really good. It goes on for like four minutes. <laughs> a baby falls out of a window and kills itself. All right, come on. All right, it's great. Don't 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 spoil movies that we're not reviewing because I want to see that. <laughs> Well, one of, these, one of these days I'm going to watch that. I'm not spoiling this. Yeah, but yeah, you know, you know what I mean. I'm not spoiling sex scene. I'm wetting your appetite for it. Ooh, here's a fun fact for the uninvited. The house that the movie was shot in, which, by the way, looked really nice. What do you think? It was beautiful. I would, I would love to live there. It recently sold for $6,950,000. Probably worth it. It, 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 it was, was amazing. Gorgeous. Like if you you, you got to be a rich, really rich, <laughs> successful author <laughs> to live there. I think that was supposed to be the guy who wrote the Da Vinci Code. You think he's Dan Brown? Yeah, that, was, that was that was supposed that was, to be that was Dan, Dan Brown. Brown. Yeah. Hey, were you? Well, this may be uh, be of interest to you, given this movie's J horror roots. It's not exactly J horror. It's Korean horror. This movie is a remake of a 2003 Korean horror film. That's really interesting because uh, we're starting to get some movies that were Korean originally. The Departed, I think, is probably the most notable, right? Yeah, the, the original movie is called A Tale of Two Sisters. Yeah, the uh, the Departed was what? Infernal Affairs? Was Infernal Affairs. That was the original? Was a Korean remake. The original, I actually didn't like that much. Oh, yeah? No. You thought, you thought America did it better? I thought Martin Scorsese is, it was, is, uh, is probably a better director. <laughs> than the Koreans? <laughs> than, than the entire country, country of, of South of... Korea. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder what this Tale of Two Sisters movie is like. I wonder if it's uh, good. From the re- the quick reviews I saw on Rotten Tomatoes, they compared the two unfavorably. They said that the original was way better. Of course. I feel like I feel like every review is going to be like, the original's better, the source material's better, the book yeah. is better. Well, like I said before, this movie has a 32% on Rotten Tomatoes. What do you think that is? It might be because people wanted a horror slasher movie and they didn't get it. That's a great point. Now, this is probably a good a time as any to bring this up. This is something that has come up in our movie watching career a lot, where we see the trailers for a movie and we build up a certain expectation for it. Like, this is what I'm expecting from the movie. This is what I want. And then when you go see the movie, it's not it at all. It's something completely different. And you dock the movie a lot of points because of it. Do you think that's fair? I don't think it's fair. I think whoever compiled the trailer is trying to get as many people to go see it as possible. They don't care if you like it or not. As long as your your ass is in the seat and they're getting money, they really couldn't give a shit. However, I hate j and that's what I thought I was getting myself into. And so I'm looking at this right now. I'm reviewing it more favorably because it, it wasn't j and I was <laughs> expecting it to be shitty, and it, and it wasn't as shitty as I thought it was going to be. Yeah, the last movie that uh, I saw that recently had that old switcheroo thing going for it was Splice. Oh, they, yeah. They sold it as a slasher movie, as a, and it a straight up wasn't. horror movie. And it was a lot more, it was a lot smarter than the trailer would give it credit for. Another great sex scene in that movie as well. Oh, oh top 10. Top 10. Best sex scenes of all time. You know time. what? I'm going to go with, I, I gave that movie a five out of five for that one scene. You could have just showed me that scene and said, this is the whole movie, just this scene. And I would have five out of five. Everyone within the sound of my voice, go, go rent, splice, or buy it, whatever. Make do sure whatever you, you have to do. Break into someone's house that you know that has it. Punch a baby in the face. I don't care. Steal. Get this movie. 
Get yourself a copy of Splice, a bottle of Jergens, and a box of Kleenex. <laughs> <laughs> That's your Saturday night. You're good to go. All right, what's next? I think they actually sell it in sex shops. <laughs> splice. You, yeah, you they have your Splice local sex shop. right next to the double dildo. <laughs> <laughs> right next to Thor, the giant horse dildo. I got Splice. Okay, what else? You got any other uh, good talking points there? Yeah, the audio in this movie is all over the fucking place. I couldn't hear what they were saying throughout the majority of the scenes. I had to continually turn it up and then turn it back down because there was going to be some type of scare going on. Yeah, that's constantly, that's uh, that's just modern horror for you. I know, but this was a major offender. It was a lot worse than the uh, than than a lot of horror movies I've, I've seen. I don't know if that's just the DVD. I don't know if it was like that in theaters, but this was... This was bad with that, and it was annoying. I also am curious, uh, Joel, what do you do? You know off the top of your head what the usual mourning period is after a spouse dies? Oh, is, is it, it is immediately, is it, is it, is it uh, immediately hook up with another woman? Im- immediately have sex with somebody else and marry them ten months later? Well, what are the stages of grief? <laughs> Let's see. The first stage is denial, right? I'll tell you right now in a second. <laughs> we'll see, like, we'll see remember, where, where remember, banging I, Elizabeth Banks falls into. Okay, step one, denial. Right. I feel fine. This can't be happening to me. Yeah. Stage two, anger. Why me? It's not fair. Stage three, bargaining. Just let me live to see my children graduate. <laughs> <laughs> kind of. Just, that, that kind of fits. That, I guess. Stage four, depression. I'm so sad. Why bother with anything? And? Acceptance. Stage five, acceptance. It's going to be okay. I can't fight it. I might as well prepare for it. I'm going to fuck Elizabeth Banks tonight. I'm going to fuck her in my study. <laughs> She's going to break my award. I mean, pretty, did you see that? That award? Yeah, that was, was a nice, nice award. Was she, nice. Shattered she shattered it. it. Yeah. <laughs> to be fair, I think she was, she was enthralled. She was in the throes of passion. Yeah, which is interesting. That one specific scene was the catalyst for this entire movie. What the uh... the banging Elizabeth Banks on the uh, in the study? That was the catalyst for the entire movie. Okay, so do you have any info on how long it usually takes somebody to to mourn their spouse? I'm afraid to look this up on Google right now because I don't know what kind of rabbit hole I'm going to fall down <laughs> when I look. <laughs> All right, what should I look up? Typical typical mourning period. Spouse, spouse. Oh, wi- widower. Widower, sure. Widower's morning. Yeah, because I remember, I, I remember watching this, and that that struck me as as really strange and odd. It was almost like he just didn't give a shit. How about I can give you a uh, <laughs> gay grief and gay <laughs> widowers that came up? That might be of use. Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll put that in my hat for later. What's normal when it comes to morning? I don't want to. <laughs> Whatever. Fuck this question. <laughs> yeah, I don't anyway. want to read this. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't matter. So, all right. I don't have any more talking points. Yeah, there's a couple more talking points. I, do you let's, have? I, every, the majority of the talking points I have left all have to do with the twist ending. So let so me, let's, let me, let let's, me, just, let's be, just jump in. Well, before it. we get to that, let me just quickly just rattle off the ones I have that don't have anything to do with that, okay? Okay. First, I thought there were some nice shots in this movie. My favorite shot in the entire movie was a scene where Emily Browning is looking up at the sun. And she's got her hands and like the, the sunlight is like coming through I like her that. fingers. That was very artistic. Very good job. This movie was directed by two guys called the Guard Brothers. What the hell does that mean? Like, unless, unless you're the Wachowski Brothers or... <laughs> like how many, how many direct brother director teams are there? The Wachowski the Brothers, the, the Cohen, Cohen Brothers. brothers. The, the guys who did uh, uh, The Book of Eli, they were brothers. Hey, wait. Are the Wachowski still brothers? Ah, yes. <laughs> Lana Wachowski. Lana, it's the. Well, they're, they're, you can they can still just call them the Wachowskis. Does he? Right? Does he, just, he? Did he have it cut off, or is it? I think. <laughs> is he? Is 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 he post op? All right, let's. You know what? <laughs> let's find out. <laughs> the Wachowski brothers. <laughs> I did not expect to be looking this up. <laughs> well, to see if he still has a wang. Yeah, sure. Shortly after the release of The Matrix Reloaded, it was rumored that Larry Wachowski began to make small public appearances dressed as a woman using the name Lana Wachowski. <laughs> yeah. Larry Wachowski is now in the process of changing his sex, dressing in public like a woman, taking female hormones, and having a sex change operation. So he's still pre-op. In a 2007 interview, Joel Silver, the producer of numerous Wachowski films, stated otherwise, saying that all the rumors concerning Larry's sex change were all untrue. Further explaining, they just don't do interviews, so people make things up. Similar statements were made to Fox News by crew members working on the Speed Racer film. 
with one employee pointing out on the call sheets, it still says Larry. Oh, okay. <laughs> Case closed. <laughs> so we can still call them the, the uh, Wachowski brothers. Yeah, what the hell were the name of the people that did the Book of Eli? The Book of Eli, directed by the Hughes brothers. There you go. All right, the Guard brothers. They did a pretty good job. Hey, what did you oh, think the, about the, the Duplass, see where she's... Duplass brothers from the Mumblecore movies? Okay, Jesus Christ. Okay, what did you think of the the shot where she's going up into her attic crawl space? They uh, put a bunch of beams in front of the camera to give perspective and depth, and there was that one light. I thought that that was very pretty. I don't even remember it. That's what I okay, think. Okay, wait, about wait. It. All right. Then there was one other scene that I thought had a very well set up shot where she was walking through the graveyard and there was, again, sun coming through the trees. And it was essentially a setup shot to show her environment, but I thought it was done very well. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, they did. Uh, surprisingly, for, for the material that they're working with, they, they did a good job directing this. This movie looked good. Okay, another, sh- uh, another talking point I have here is we have a nice uh, ghost molestation scene. <laughs> ghost in bed molestation scene, just like in The Unborn. Remember in the very beginning of the movie? Yeah. A ghostly decomposing arm just comes out of nowhere and grabs her knee and starts fondling her a little bit. Yeah. So that was a a nice, nice thing to have. Always a welcome thing. Yeah. I'd actually go change my pants after that. Ghost molestation. Can never get enough of that. Okay. So let's jump right into the, uh, right into the talking points that deal with the twist ending. Yes. Oh, okay. One, one last thing I have one last thing for the 0% of people that are listening to this, that like, Stargate SG-1. There was a Stargate cameo in there for two seconds. Two seconds. Don S. Davis from Stargate SG-1. Sheriff's he, office? Nope, nope, nope. He, <laughs> Where the hell he, is it? He had the most pointless cameo in the movie. In the scene where they're uh, in the meat locker or whatever, he sticks his head up and he's like... Uh, <laughs> Hey, we, we need to get the... Those berries or Those whatever. berries or the meat or whatever the fuck. Matt, those berries aren't getting any pressure. Yeah, I'm sure all the uh, Stargate General, SG-1 Gen- are really yeah. excited so, about So, now you know, General Hammond is in this movie, so go check it out if you want to see him. All right, let's, let's, all right, let's stop dancing around the issue and finally get to the meat and potatoes of this movie. So, this entire movie is structured on the whole idea that the wife, soon-to-be wife, because they're going to be married soon, she's bad and that she's a murderer... And serial, she's being serial killer. She's a serial killer, and she's being uh, the hero's being haunted by these ghosts. Blah blah blah. And throughout the movie, the hero girl is seeing visions constantly. It's also insinuated ghosts. that these ghosts are are visiting her to try and spur you know spur her to, to save her to, right? to to save her or spur her to get vengeance for them. But uh, in the end, ultimately, things don't turn out as they seem. <laughs> Essentially, and I guess you could kind of see this twist coming. Unfortunately, I didn't. You um, didn't? I, did, I didn't see that twist. Me neither. I didn't see it either the first time I saw it. And uh, So they did a good job disguising it, I guess. They, they, they really did, especially with the sister. Anna, the lead, is very mentally ill. She is so thoroughly schizoid that the hallucinations she's having and her inability to deal with her past of accidentally killing her sister and mother by burning down the boathouse by mistake after she catches her father cheating on her dying mother with the nurse is uh, just too much for for her for her mind to bear so she just blocks it out and creates this pseudo reality essentially she takes the gasoline from the boathouse where her mother was being kept and puts it in a watering can after she sees her father cheating on her mother in the main house she's bringing the watering can up to the house to just burn the whole place down killing her father and the nurse for cheating on her dying mother unfortunately her sister comes back drunk knocks over a lamp or lantern there's gas still leaking out of the gas main that heats the complex and blows up the boathouse killing her mother and drunk sister the sister throughout the entire movie is a fabrication of her mind or is it a ghost they don't really ever explain it. Female Tyler Durden. Essentially, that's what it is. Or is it? Or is it a ghost? No, it's female Tyler Durden. What about the mother, then? What about her? Those are just delusions. The, all the ghosts are delusions. Yeah, she's just insane. It's great the way that they break down her her sister's character at the end. The light flickers on. There's a motion-sensing light, and it shows her covered in blood. Originally, she sees the reflection of her sister holding the knife. Yep. The light comes on, her sister disappears, and what's revealed, it's that 
It is her holding the knife. It was her she, all along. It was her all along. She killed Elizabeth Banks. Elizabeth Banks. That little girl murdered Elizabeth Banks. Dra- this 90 pound girl killed Elizabeth Banks and dragged her into a dumpster. And dumped her in there. You know what, though? I don't feel bad for her because she's banging this guy while, you know, his the woman she's taking care of is withering away in a effing boathouse. Hey, man, we all have needs. Come on. Go find them somewhere else. Well, well, like I was telling you before, the, I did not like this movie at all the first time I saw it. And it was a much different experience for me the second time. You enjoy it? I, I liked it a little better. I, I specifically was paying attention to see if the movie's internal logic held up. In the same way that you would rewatch Fight Club. Exactly, if exactly. Can, if the internal and, logic held up. And that's the perfect, uh, the perfect comparison because just like Fight Club, these two movies are never the same twice. Like, the first time you watch it is one way, and you can never get that first time. Like, in the first time I ever saw Fight Club, I I hated the Marla character. I thought she was a bitch. I couldn't, like, she's like, get, get her out of here. She's just causing trouble. But you watch it the second time, and she's more sympathetic of a character. The same thing in this movie. The first time, I hated everything having to do with the, the girlfriend story and the parents. But when you watch it now, it becomes a much sadder story of uh, this insane girl that completely rips this family apart. So I thought they did a good job with that. I like that sort of thing. Movies like this, I never really have a problem with just because the second time you view it, the third time you view it, you, you pick up more details. I don't know. I think the movie gets more enjoyable every time you watch it. This is a real slow burn, I guess. So the more you watch, the more you like it. Let's see. Oh, I thought that the uh, they did a lot of interesting things with the imaginary sister stuff. Yeah. I liked how she was essentially her conscience throughout the entire movie like the things that she would say like in the beginning of the movie like she would be like why didn't you write me you know where were you you never you, you didn't send get my gifts or anything like these are all like her internalized guilt coming out and then it, it goes from that from guilt to anger to her own internal delusions because if you remember it was the sister that was perpetuating this whole plot line of the girlfriend of elizabeth banks being evil it was the girl it was the sister that kept pushing and pushing and pushing so it was her own like schizophrenic delusions personified, pushing her towards this eventual murder. It was great though because without that, the delusion of her sister pushing that, she wouldn't have been able to keep the charade going for as long as she could have kept it going, and she would have been forced to deal with the unfortunate memory of killing her mother and killing her sister. I mean, she she also murdered her, I guess boyfriend-esque character because he essentially told her what he he watched what happened he saw the truth he saw the truth she, no, she pushed him, she pushed off, him a cliff. off a cliff and broke his back <clears throat> just because psychologically she, and and totally erased the memory she psychologically could not deal with it yep on uh, my first viewing i thought that was dumb on the second viewing i thought that was a, a little better i also thought that it was interesting that there's a scene where the mother rises up like her the ghost of the mother rises up when she's in the boathouse or whatever and she points her finger straight ahead and goes, Murder! The implication being that she's pointing to Elizabeth Banks. But in reality... She's pointing at her. At her, yeah. Like, so, even in her own mind, she knows. Like, at her subconscious level, she knows that she did it. But consciously, she's not willing to... Yeah, to, exactly. So, to I thought, further. again, first time I watched it, this is retarded. Second time I watched it, not bad. It's kind of interesting. Also, the uh, the sister character also represented her libido a little bit. If you remember, the boyfriend came up. They're, yeah. they're sitting on the dock, and the boyfriend comes up, and, and the sister goes, see you later, and abandons her. It's like, no, you're not going to leave me here, are you? It's like, what are sisters for? And kind of forces her to interact with the boyfriend. Yeah. Which is, which is what I guess uh, she wanted. Just like Fight Club, kind of. What yeah, about? it is. Her sister was taller, hotter, more forceful, stronger. Yeah, she was free in all the ways. She was free that she in was all not. the ways that she was not. The so poor father. So poor father. The man's cheating on his dying wife. I have does he no... deserve? Does he deserve this? Really? Yes. I have no sympathy for this man. Okay, let me get this straight. Let, let me get this straight. His wife is dying. He is paying for her health care, keeping her alive, just as because... he promised to do when he got married to her. Yeah, just because you know he's weak and. He wants to get his uh, his rocks off. He fucks Elizabeth Banks. Just because of that indiscretion, he deserves to have his girlfriend murdered, his dying wife blown up, his daughter blown away, and now 
him left alone with an insane daughter that murdered everybody. So he deserved it, right? Yes. There's repercussions to your actions. And he was doing that in the house that his two daughters live in with his dying wife outside in an effing boathouse with gasoline everywhere. Yes, he deserves it. Why would he put his wife out into the goddamn boathouse? <laughs> All right, so why, is, why is she oh, outside on a lake in a boathouse f- with a giant gasoline tank? So let me let me get this let me get this straight just just for one second. Nicholas Cage goes on a cocaine fueled uh, <laughs> spree through New, New Orleans, and you're okay with that? This guy fucks Elizabeth Banks, and he should be murdered. I believe in the sanctity of marriage, Joel. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think that the uh, <laughs> that the nipple shot at an hour and four minutes into the movie had anything to do with her insanity? It had something to do with my insanity. <laughs> I I wanted to grab them, <laughs> and I couldn't get through the television. I wanted I, I I wanted to the ring style another J horror go backwards in through to the television <laughs> to grab her tits. Yeah, I was wondering why you, you were slapping the TV. <laughs> it's like, hey, see me? Hey, yeah. knock it off. <laughs> They were phenomenal. I'm willing to fly to Australia just to see them. What? what I mean, what? You're you. You seem to enjoy them. You wrote down the exact moment and second in the movie that that occurred. I did indeed. I'm like, oh, hmm, hmm. Here it is. That's me. That's me scrawling. <laughs> okay. All right. Let me talk about the, the. Let's go back to the sister again. Like I said before, like the, when I was watching this again for the second time, I was paying close attention to see if the internal logic and structure of the movie would work, and they did a really good job with how they dealt with the sister character. If you noticed, no one ever talked to her, except for Emily Browning. Only the hero girl ever spoke directly to her. Whenever it looked like anybody was talking to her, it was just incidental. Like she just happened to be standing there. Every time. No one ever touched her either. They would always walk around her. Stuff like that. So I thought they did a good job with that. What I'm interested in, you know, knowing if I if I ever do watch this movie again is does she speak to her sister in front of the other characters? Yes, yeah, she does. Multiple and, times. And no one ever brings that nope, up. No one because she when she talks, she's just being she's doing two things when she talks to other people. She's being A a wise ass or B defending her sister so there's no reason to to say anything to her like everything that she says it makes sense that no one would respond to it because she they're just throwaway comments that she says but she does indeed talk to people like she says leave her alone you know stuff like that so right it, it works it works if, when you watch it again it does work they, they did a good job with that there there are only there are two things in this movie that i wonder whether or not you know, logistically, it works. Okay, and I'll run them with down with you. See what you think. Well, I'm curious to know if the first thing is going to be the psychiatrist. In the ten months that she was in the psychiatric hospital, he never brought up that her sister and mother were dead. Maybe he did, and she just suppressed it. Every time, she seems to be pretty good at that. It's her speciality. That's her special mutant power. <laughs> yeah, she was in the uh, in the Z Men. She didn't quite make it to the X Men. <laughs> okay, here here are the things that uh, that I question whether or not they actually happened or not. Okay, number one, when we see the uh, the ghost of the boyfriend or whatever, when she has that delusion and she goes, "Look, it really happened," and she has all these bruises on her hands, did she do that to herself? No. If you watch the scene again. You'll see that the boyfriend oh, was about yes. to fall off the rock because she's pushing him off, and he's grabbing her arm very tightly to try and not fall off this cliff and die. Touche. Well done, guard brothers. <laughs> you did it again. You got me. And, okay, and the other thing, now this is a little bit better. At the funeral for the boyfriend, okay, she sees the little ghost girl, and the little ghost girl leads her away into uh, an area where there are the graves of three children that just happen to be the exact children of the ghosts that she's seeing in her delusions. And then she later goes on the internet and finds pictures of these exact kids on the internet. How would she know? How would she know that? Like exactly where to go and like that, that they're, they're here. They're buried here. Here they are. Because her roommate spent the last 10 months telling stories about the children that she murdered. Yeah, that's one thing, but it's not like she's going to go... Probably where they were buried, <clears throat> probably where it happened. Here are the exact GPS locations. <laughs> right ascension, declination, go here. Here's exactly where they are. I don't know, man. That cemetery wasn't that big. That's it. That's all I got. 
Is uh, it? That's it. That's it. Those are my two. I mean, she's uh, she's, she's 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 living across from this this psychotics, you know, Mildred Kemp. Yeah, Mildred Kemp. That's the worst name. Murdered. That is the worst, like mildew kind of name, right? She looked like mildew. She looked disgusting. She actually looked like if you dug Kurt Cobain's body back up and had it act in this movie, gave him the Wachowski brothers sex if change. <laughs> <laughs> You get Mildred and then, Kemp. And then, and then, that that you you get Mildred Kemp. Yeah, that's essentially what. No, yeah, that was that was spot on. That's exactly what it looked like. <laughs> she was grunge, man. Did you see that robe she was wearing? Yeah, that flannel was, robe. Yeah, I liked it. She she's you know they're close to Seattle, I guess. <laughs> it, hey, that's another thing. It was never raining. They were in the Pacific Northwest. It was sunny the entire movie. How unrealistic. <laughs> <laughs> what a joke. Everything else, forget it. One out of five. <laughs> One out of five. It wasn't raining once. <laughs> all right, that, that's all my talking points. You got anything else? That's pretty much it. That's all I got. Okay, Martin. Now's the time where we ask the question, was it really that bad? Rotten Tomatoes says 32%, but the viewers say 52%. Either way, that's a shit score. I don't know how you that slice is, it. That, that is a shitty score. So on a scale of one to five... What do you give 2009's The Uninvited? I give it a three out of five. And I think that it might be skewed because I was expecting something horrible and was giving something that maybe yeah, considering wasn't we, as shit. Considering as we're on a show called be. Yeah, It's That Bad. <laughs> I mean, we're, we, yeah, we're, we're, we're running a podcast called Yeah, It's That Bad. And I thought it was going to be really shitty, the movie selection. We're going to have to up our game next time. Pick a, oh, pick no. A, pick a really don't, shitty movie. Don't worry. I got you. I got you covered. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what about you? What is your final score on the second Final game? verdict on The Uninvited. Like I said before, I did not like this movie at all when I first saw it. I gave it a two out of five. That it was a joke. But on the second viewing, the movie completely changes for me. Completely changed the second time around. And I enjoyed it. I thought it was like a sad psychological profile of this deranged girl like when you know what's really going on and you see what's going on in these scenes it's just kind of it is kind of sad like what's what's happening so i'm gonna bump it up i'm gonna match your score a solid three out of five this movie has been saved from the dumpster bin i was considering just throwing it away (laughs) 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 so yeah it's not that bad 32 percent i don't know Let's see what the other, uh, what the other, what the, what did the critics have to say? A mild improvement over its nigh unwatchable predecessor. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> the latest teen horror directed by Charles and Thomas Gard has a bit more patience than such films usually display. Not nearly as cl- creepy or as stylish as the shot original. This version trades eerie atmosphere for clunky physical effects. Hmm. That's I fair because I can't, the, I, I, I can't argue that. The, the physical effects were pretty shitty. The trouble is a twist ending that even a brain-dead centipede will see coming a long way off. Jeez, man. Ouch. Yeah, that's really really burning me. That's the sickest burn I ever heard. Hey, hey, but you just point your finger at me. I'm going to wag it back at you (laughs) because you said that you didn't see it coming either the first time you watched it. I guess I'm a brain-dead centipede. So the pace plods, the acting is unconvincing, and there are no goosebump moments. See, but again, these people are expecting a slasher horror. Yeah, that's how they're rating. This is it. it. This is it. It's it's that whole expectation. It's that whole thing. expectation thing. They're rating it as that, and I didn't. You know, I don't like those movies. That's not what I got, and so I'm a little happier about it. Well, the final review is yikes, or rather, yawn. Anyway, well done. <laughs> one one last note I want to end this on. Take a look at the cover art and the poster for this movie it's a picture of a girl peeking through a window with her body pressed up to glass and her body is obscured you can't see the nipples not at all but this is like a recurring uh, trend in poster design these days this poster is just like the cover of the human centipede yes it is where where somebody is slapped up against the glass And, and i know there are other movies that are just like this but i just i can't picture them right now but i know they're out there so if you're out there and you're listening to this and you know more write in let us know. <laughs> because Joel is that lazy. He won't look it up. I won't do the work. I'm not. <laughs> Making this pocket is enough work, you know. I don't need to do any outside homework. Okay, Martin. I guess that wraps up uh, The Uninvited. Tune in next week where we will be reviewing 2009's White Out, starring Kate Beckinsale. 
That movie's about a, a murder in Antarctica or, or something. That sounds fucking horrendous. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, tune in and see, and we'll find out if it's really that bad. <laughs>